Well, tonight we turn our attention back to Romans, so if you'll take your Bibles and open up with me to Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 9. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5 tonight. Uh, We will not cover all of it. Uh, We're going to discuss tonight Paul's sorrow for unbelieving Israel. So Romans chapter 9, verse 1 through 5 is the text we'll begin to consider Paul wrote these words to the church at Rome. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, and eternally blessed God. Amen. So tonight, we begin a journey through three of the most amazing chapters in all of the Bible, Romans chapter 9 through 11. It has been said that These chapters are some of the most difficult to understand. In fact, some commentators will stop at Romans chapter 8 and not continue on. While some say that it's hard to understand, others, especially preachers, will even avoid the chapter altogether intentionally. It should be noted that some have come to this portion of the Bible and have abandoned their hermeneutics that they used from chapter 1 through 8, And then they get to chapter 9, and all of a sudden, things are totally different than they used to be, and they end up with an interpretation that is really foreign to what the Apostle Paul has in mind altogether. And some have suggested that this portion has no real flow in the argument of Paul in the book of Romans, that it seems almost um, out of context, Romans 9 through 11, that you would be going along and talking about this great salvation that we have in Christ, and So much so that he would talk about our security and our safety that we have in God and in Christ and reach that climax, that apex, that mountaintop where we come to Romans 8.39 where it says, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And it seems somewhat abnormal all of a sudden to change the subject and to go into Paul's sorrow for Israel. Some believe that it would seem more appropriate that it would be Romans 8.39, then immediately go into Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, based on the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Right straight in the application. So although some have suggested that it seems kind of strange that Paul would place that there, I believe it is an intentional placement by the Apostle Paul for a number of reasons. First of all, he's going to help explain to all of us God's plan for the Jews, God's plan for Israel. And this is not out of context or out of the thought or the flow of thought for the Apostle Paul because Paul is a very good teacher and he thinks logically. And of course he anticipates the opposition that will come to his teaching of chapter 1 through 8. And he's making the argument that God is saving both Jew and Gentile and he's saving them apart from the law and that he's saving them apart from what the Jews would have believed in, which we would call Judaism, which was salvation through law-keeping or circumcision. And so the church at Rome at that time, when Paul first came there, was predominantly a Jewish population. He would go to the synagogue first, and then he would win those there to Christ, and then he would establish a church. But that was rapidly changing because there were more and more Gentiles in the area of Rome coming to Christ and were becoming part of the church. So there would be a natural question that would arise in the heart and the mind of the Jewish members of that church at Rome. What exactly then does the Jew, what exactly does the place of the Jew have in the redemption of God? What exactly, what exact place does Israel have in the plan and purpose of God? It would seem almost as if God has set Israel aside for some reason because In the mind of the Jew, you have to understand, we don't even think this way because the Jewish people had been given statement after statement by God in the Old Testament that they were a special people, uniquely chosen by God, above all the other nations, and were uniquely loved and foreknown by God. 
And then something seems to go awry whenever the Messiah shows up and the majority of the Jewish nation reject the one that the Old Testament prophets actually said was coming. So there would be natural questions being raised as to why in the world would Israel reject the one that you say is the true Messiah? And does that mean that Israel doesn't have a place anymore in the plan of God? And what about the commandments and the covenants and the promises and all the things that are given in the Old Testament regarding the Jewish people? Are those no longer promised? Are they no longer needed? Or is God changing his mind? Or is God going back on his covenant? These would be questions that only a Jewish person in that context would raise because they would understand specifically from the Old Testament that that is the case, that God had promised them that he was their covenant people. Just a couple of verses that highlight this so you can kind of get a mindset of how the Jewish people would think and remember that they were not like most American evangelicals that don't know their Bibles. They knew their Old Testament scriptures. If you were a Jewish young man by the age of 12, you had memorized the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. So these verses would have been on your mind. You would have known them. Every Sabbath day, there would have been passages read, no doubt, that would reflect the honor that God had given to Israel and the promises of the covenant that God had given to Israel. For instance, like Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 through 9 says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, talking about Israel. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. Listen to these words. A special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to his fathers, to your fathers, and the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations. Verses like Deuteronomy 26, verse 18 and following. Also today, the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people, just as he promised you that you should keep his commandments and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made in praise, in name, in honor, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. Deuteronomy 28, 8. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouse and in all which you set your hand to do, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord God is giving you. And the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you. Deuteronomy 10 says this in verse 14, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. And the Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples. You see a theme going in the mind of the Jewish people in the works of the uh, Old Testament? In 1 Samuel 12, 22, it says, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great namesake because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Even Amos 3, 2, often we quote this verse, you only, referring to Israel, I have known of all the families of the earth. It doesn't stop there. Jeremiah spoke of this. He said this, the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with your tambourines, and shall go forth in dances of those who rejoice, and you shall yet plant vines on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and eat them in the, as ordinary food, for there shall be a day when the watchman will cry out on Mount Ephraim, Arise, and let us go to Zion, to the Lord our God. With this evident clear teaching from the Bible, it would seem rather strange that all of a sudden God would turn away from Israel and turn to the Gentiles. So they would one, they would naturally wonder, do the Jews have a future? Are all the promises that God gave to Israel now canceled? 
are the covenants that God made with Israel now no longer in effect. And the problem was even clearly seen in the book of Acts whenever God was turning just from the nation Israel to the Gentile nations. You remember in Acts chapter 2, whenever Peter preached, there were 3,000 saved in one day. That's 3,000 men. They didn't count the women, so there were 3,000 men that were counted that were saved that day. Then in chapter 4, by the time we get there, there's 5,000 men who are saved in Jerusalem. So you have over probably 20,000 people that have come to Christ in the first few chapters of the book of Acts. So it seems like it's predominantly a Jewish work, that God's working among the Jewish people. But that's not what the book of Acts is about. The book of Acts is about the Acts of the Apostles as they move about and beyond Jerusalem into Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth and reach the Gentile pagan nations with the gospel of Christ. But that was not something that the Jewish people understood. And it definitely was not something that the Jewish people anticipated. And it also was not something that the Jewish people liked at all. When we get to Acts chapter 14, the Bible says, Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done among them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. But as I told you, the Jews were not eager to accept this at all. In fact, many of them were unwilling to accept the fact that God had opened the door of faith to the Gentile nations. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 44, it says, And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision, that's the Jewish Israelites, who believed were astonished. Now you look up that word, and you'll find out what that simply means in the original language is, it blew their mind. They were totally astounded at the fact that God would save a Gentile, that he would bring these pagan idolaters into the covenant that he would make them part of the church and so it goes on and says and those of the circumcision who believe were astonished as many as came with peter because the gift of the holy spirit had been poured out on the gentiles also and one of the reasons why you have a delay in the book of acts for the holy spirit to show up is for the point that the apostle would show up and confirm that the gentiles actually got the same holy spirit that the jews did in the book of acts chapter 2 Otherwise, there would have been a division. There would have been, you have the Holy Spirit over here, but we have a different one over here in the Gentile community. But they got the same Holy Spirit. It was evidenced by the same gift of the speaking of languages. And then whenever it came together, it even says this in Acts 10, for they heard them speak with other tongues or languages and magnify God. That was the proof that they had received the same Holy Spirit that the Jews had received in Acts chapter 2. And Peter answered and said, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So God is not only baptizing the Jews, but now he's baptizing the Gentiles. He's reaching out beyond Jerusalem, beyond Israel to the Gentiles. But as I told you, this was not something that was well accepted among the people of Israel. This was not something that was easily swallowed. Because if you remember the earlier verses I read in Deuteronomy specifically, Israel is the chosen people of God. They are God's special people. They are God's unique people that are placed above all other nations. And then all of a sudden, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. It is almost as if God has turned his back on Israel. And now he's bringing in all of these other nations in Acts 15, it hits a high point in the Council of Jerusalem where there is a very, very hotly debated issue about the Gentiles coming into the church and what they are to do in regard to circumcision and the law of God. I won't go through all of that, but I would just want to point out a couple of things about that. In Acts 15, 7, it says, And when there had been much dispute, in other words, there was a whole lot of arguing going on, there was a division and this was among the leadership there in the council of Jerusalem. Peter rose up and said to them in Acts 15, 7, Men and brethren, you know that for a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God who knows the heart acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, listen to this, just as he did to us, 
and made, and here's the point, and made no distinction between us and them. Now, if you were an Israelite of that day, and you had a Gentile come into your house before this event occurred, you were defiled. And you would have to go through times of cleansing just because you had some kind of initial contact with a Gentile. They were outside the covenant. They were aliens to the commonwealth of Israel. They were pagans and idolaters, and they were hated and considered those that God even hated. And now things are changing rapidly. And now there are words that even Peter, the apostle, a Jew, says, there's no distinction between us. Acts 15, 19 said, therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. There were those who were troubling them. We don't want anything to do with you guys. We don't want you in our church at all. So Paul's teaching and writing to the church at Rome would have anticipated this. He would have known that there would have been those in the church that would have objected to the fact that God's bringing Gentiles into the church, that he's actually saving these pagan idolaters. And when you read the book of Romans, you probably have noted it before, how often Paul the Apostle talks about how God is bringing in the Gentiles. He's saving Jews and Greeks, right? As he writes this letter and pens it, and then it is sent to the church at Rome. You remember the words like in Romans 1? You can follow these if you'd like since you're in Romans. In Romans 1, 5, it says there that through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. Among all nations. By the way, do you know whenever you read John 3 and we talk about Nicodemus and Nicodemus meeting with Jesus and discussing the whole topic about being born again? And then Jesus launches into this great sermon about how you are sovereignly saved by the very breath of God. The, the Holy Spirit moves as he wills. And then you must be born again and born from above to be saved. In that same context, if you remember, is the famous verse that most people know but most people don't understand. And it's John 3.16, which is that God so loved the what? The world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, in our context, because we're American evangelicals, we think that means every single person in the United States and the world. But in fact, in the Jewish mindset, whenever Nicodemus heard the word world, he wasn't thinking every single human being that's ever lived. He was thinking the pagan nations, the Gentiles, these people who are idolaters, the ones that we consider our enemies, the ones that we don't want anything to do with, the ones that we are defiled if we have any contact with. And so whenever Nicodemus heard those words, he was astounded, no doubt, clearly, just as much as any other Jew would be, that God would reach out beyond Israel, beyond the ones that he had made covenant with, and actually go to the Gentile nation. So whenever Paul writes these words in Romans 1, 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations, I mean, that is an astounding thing to a Jewish mind. He goes on and says, even in verse 7, remember, this is a, a population of people in a church at Rome that are both Jew and Gentile, probably predominantly Jewish by this time. In verse 7 it says, and to all who are in Rome, beloved of God. Being beloved of God was uniquely a term for Israel. They were the beloved of God. They were the ones uniquely foreknown by God among all the nations. Romans 1.13, it says, And now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I planned to come to you, but was hindered in ten now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. And then Paul says these words in verse 14, For I am a debtor to the Greeks and the barbarians. What? You're in debt to share the gospel with the Gentile pagan nations and the barbarians? The ones who are, the name comes from Barbar. I mean, they didn't even speak coherently. They were pagan idolaters. So, verse 16, Paul reminds us that the gospel was sent and is the power of God to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, yes, but also to the Greek or the Gentile. He reminds us of that again in chapter 2, verse 10, that he says that, Glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. 
And then he says these words, for there is no partiality with God. In Romans 2.17, Paul says these words, which are shocking to a Jewish mind. He says, indeed, you are called a Jew, and you rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things which are excellent, being instructed out of the law. But then he reminds them in chapter 2, verse 24, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, you Jewish people. Verse 25, he says, the circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Then he goes a little further and says in chapter 2, verse 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men but from God. Now, you hear that, you understand what he's saying there. To the Jew, it didn't make any sense because circumcision was a main, it was a big deal to them. It was a sign of the covenant, that you were in the covenant. And now it seems like Paul is saying it doesn't matter whether you have it or you don't have it. As long as you have faith in Christ, that's all that matters. So all of these things that were in the Old Testament that were given to Israel, all the promises, all the covenants, all the signs of the covenant seem to be to no advantage whatsoever. And for whatever reason to the Jews seem to be no advantage. That's why in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, what advantage then is there to being a Jew? What is the profit of circumcision? What's the point? Why have all of that stuff? Why go through all of that? He even reminds them in Romans 3.21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Apart from the law that we've been keeping our whole life, been practicing, teaching, obeying, everything comes apart from the law. He goes on and says in chapter 3.29, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he just the God of Israel Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since they are, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do you hear a theme that's coming out all through this as the Jew listens to the words of the Apostle Paul? It almost seems like that all the things that they had that they were counting as a privilege and as an honor that were given to them sovereignly by God positionally and that seemed to be a place of, uh, Tremendous blessing and by God's grace don't seem to have much weight anymore. Romans 4, 9 says, does, the, does this blessing then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. Verse 13 of chapter 4 says, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through righteousness of faith. Again, all this practice for years doesn't seem to have any effect at all. Romans 4.17 even says of Abraham that I have made you a father of many nations, not just of Israel. All of these verses and more could lead a Jew to believe that what he was, where he came from, who he was, his significance, His placement in the plan of God really meant nothing at all. Really meant nothing at all. So many have concluded that it's over. That it's over for Israel. As one pastor even told me on one occasion, I mean, Israel is just another pagan nation among many. It's over. Is it over? Is it over for Israel? Well, Romans 9 through 11 is going to challenge us a little bit. It's going to make us think a little bit. When we come to this text, Paul's going to be bringing up this whole topic for a number of reasons, but the primary reason is to answer the question as to whether or not God has a purpose for Israel anymore. Also, how do we reconcile in our own mind how Israel, who was chosen of God, given the covenants, given the promises, given the position that they had, and the Messiah himself came through them, how is it that that very nation would reject Messiah? How is it that the very ones that God chose and gave all of that to would reject the one that you claim to be the Messiah? How do we reconcile that? What do we do with that? And there's another reason why Paul brings this up right here. It seems like almost kind of like out of context. Why would he start all of a sudden with Israel and God's plan for Israel? 
Well, there's another reason why, and that is this. To the Jewish mind, he's thinking already, well, God's going to give up on the covenants. He's going to give up on his promises. Obviously, he's not going to follow through with it. So all this talk about security, Paul, that you're talking about, that we are secure in Christ and we'll never be separated from the love of Christ and we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ and everyone's going to finally be justified and then they're going to eventually be glorified. How do we know that's even true? I mean, if God's going to promise something to Israel and then walk away from his promise, how do you know you're secure? If God's going to make a covenant with a nation and then back out on that covenant, how do you know then that, in fact, you're secure just because God said so? See, now, you may not think like that, but they were thinking like that. They were wondering whether or not God was who he said he was. Was he faithful to his promises? They didn't read the Old Testament like many of us may read it today. They read it in such a way that they believed that, in fact, God was going to grant them exactly what he promised them. And when things went haywire and went wrong and rejection occurred, and then eventually, by the the time of 70 A.D., and Israel was literally destroyed, Jerusalem was just destroyed, and the temple was leveled, you could imagine how those things would be considered. What in the world is God doing? So Paul's going to answer those questions he's going to help us work through that and he's going to answer a question that he even poses in romans chapter 11 look at that for a moment romans 11 1 very important question and that is this paul says this romans 11 1 i say then has god cast away his people certainly not that's that strong negative that paul likes to use meginotai Absolutely no way. He says, For I also am an Israelite and the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. That's where Paul's going. That's where he's headed. But he's going to help us to understand a lot more about this. And he's going to explain some things that are very deep. He's going to plunge deep into the very thoughts and counsels and plans of God that deal with God's purpose and plan for Israel from a sovereign salvation viewpoint. As I told you, that this, this passage is probably one of the most neglected, sadly, among evangelicals. <clears throat> and it's neglected because a lot of people just believe it's hard to understand, or sometimes, frankly, it is offensive. And it will deal with you. It can change your whole view of God dramatically. So tonight, though, we're just beginning, and we're just looking at a couple of the verses because... The first few verses of Romans 9 are some of the most profound verses in all of the Bible because they are revealing of the heart of Paul for his own people. But more importantly, they are a revelation of the heart of Paul for the lost, for the one that doesn't believe the gospel. And if you can read these verses and walk away without being convicted, you haven't read them. Because they are deeply convicting. Because whenever you see how much Paul loved his own people, and you see how much compassion he had for the lost, and we wonder if we can even speak a word. Paul was an amazing man, no doubt, filled with the Holy Spirit, but he had a passion for his own people. A passion for for them to come to their Messiah and to believe the gospel of Christ and to be saved from the wrath to come. Three points. The commitment of Paul to the truth for the Jews. Second point, the compassion of Paul for the tragedy facing the Jews. And third, the confession of Paul for the trade for the Jews. Let's look at this. It's really a simple passage, but... Again, very profound. The beginning is the commitment of Paul to the truth for the Jews. He says in verse 1, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. So Paul begins by expressing his genuine, continual grief for the lost state of Israel 
And he expresses this in very intense language and very deep language about sorrow and grief. And Paul is very, very well acquainted with the gospel. We would agree with that. He actually wrote Romans, so we know he's very well acquainted with the gospel. But he's also acquainted with the consequences of rejecting the gospel. What it means to a person who rejects the gospel and doesn't believe in Christ as their Lord and Savior. And this is intensified by the knowledge that the more knowledge you have, the more severe judgment you get. And the people of Israel had the most. They had the most. They had the Old Covenant. They had the Old Testament. It was through them that Messiah came. He lived among them. He preached among them. He taught among them. He did miracles among them. He confessed God to them over and over again, proved himself over and over again to be God, and they concluded he was from the devil. And God wrote them off. Chapter 12, John. Blinded their eyes, deafened their ears, so they could never hear again. The amount of responsibility they had to believe the gospel came because of the weight of information and evidence that they had. As I even point out to you in verse 4 of Romans 9, it says they were Israelites. They had the adoption. They had the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the, the promises, the fathers. They also, according to the flesh, Christ came through them. So to more, to whom much is given, you know the rest of it, what? Much is required. The more truth you have, the more accountable you are. The more you know, the more privilege and opportunity you have, the more severe the judgment if you reject what God has given to you. This is a principle taught throughout Scripture. In fact, in James 3.1, it says to those who teach in the church, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Why? Because if you're a good teacher, hopefully you know more than your student. If you're a good teacher, you are learning more as you study. And you are responsible for all that you know and all that you learn. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 17 says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give them no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I shall require from your hand. He goes on and says in that same text, Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Luke chapter 12, verse 47, Jesus says something very similar. He says, and that servant who knew his master's will, listen to what he's saying now, the servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will be asked more. So Paul begins with the triple oath that he is about to tell them some truth. And this truth is profound. In fact, the reason why he begins with the triple oath is because it's unbelievable that he would say something like this. I mean, who would say this? Who would be willing to go as far as the Apostle Paul and say what he said and really mean what he said? That's the point. The statement that he made is an undeniable commitment for the Apostle Paul willingness to go to eternal hell for the sake of his brothers. The Apostle Paul had presented himself blameless before the church at Rome and he had never misled them or told them lies. And so it seems kind of strange that he would have to say what he says that I'm telling you the truth. I am not lying. He binds it up in his commitment to Christ, his commitment to his own conscience, and his commitment to the Holy Spirit. And the reason why is because what he says is so profoundly deep and so profoundly troubling and so profoundly unbelievable that he would do this. 
His commitment is given to us here in verse 1, I tell you the truth in Christ. The word truth is the first word in the Greek text, which means it is emphasized. The truth is the point here. What he's about to say is the point here. Although the witnesses that is given here is important, yes, the truth is the most important thing. I tell you the truth in Christ, he says. I am not lying. He says, I, uh, also my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. So he, he gives three witnesses to his telling the truth. The first is Christ, the second is conscience, and the third is the Holy Spirit. He mentions in Christ because Christ is his Savior and his Lord and the one who holds him accountable in judgment. In fact, this is the same Christ that appeared to him on the Damascus Road whenever he was on the road to get more Christians to try and to put to death. Because at that time, he believed that they were false religions. They were people who were idolaters and that they were people who worshipped false gods. And so they were going after them. He was going after them to kill them. But this is the Christ who appeared on the road to Damascus and dramatically converts Saul changes, changes his name to Paul and makes him a missionary to the Gentiles. So the genuine heartfelt emotion that Paul had for the Jews is evident because he appeals to Christ. And he says, Christ is my Savior. He saved me. I'm a Jew. But also Christ is my judge. And he knows me. He knows everything about me. And I'm united to him and I call him to witness to what I'm telling you is true. He knows my heart. As one author said, Paul's union with Christ was the orbit within which his emotions moved and the fountain from which it flowed. In other words, Christ, was, Christ who was the apostle's very life and breath would attest to the truth that he was about to teach. His omniscient, righteous, sovereign, gracious Lord who perfectly knew Paul's heart and motives would affirm the truthfulness of the apostle's limitless love for his fellow Jews. In the words of the 19th century Swiss commentator and theologian, Frederick Godet, he wrote these words, in the eyes of Paul, there is something so holy in Christ that in the pure and luminous atmosphere of his felt presence, no lie and not even an exaggeration is possible. And Paul frequently called on God as his witness in a number of verses, like in chapter uh, one in verse nine of Romans, he called on God as his witness. In Second Corinthians one twenty three, he says, "I call God as my witness to my soul." In Second Corinthians eleven thirty one, he says, "The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, He who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying." <laughs> but there's no place in Scripture, no place where he does it this way where he calls on Christ, his conscience, and the Holy Spirit to affirm the truth that he's saying. The second one is the conscience. Conscience is that very important part of our being that God has given to us. Everyone has a conscience, but your conscience has to be informed by truth to work properly. A person who doesn't have a good conscience can be informed by error, can be informed by immorality, can be informed by impurity, but a person who has the law of God and the Holy Spirit, their conscience can be informed toward purity and morality and God-honoring thoughts and God-honoring -honor action. And Paul knew that. He even said in Romans chapter 2, verse 14 about the Gentiles that they have a conscience. They're born with a conscience. In fact, that conscience either excuses them or accuses them. And God wrote the law of God on their hearts. And how they respond and react to that law that God gave them will either enable their conscience to be that much stronger or will make their conscience, as Paul refers to in Timothy, a seared conscience that doesn't work. But Paul's conscience was informed. It was informed by the Word of God. It was informed by the Holy Spirit. It was informed by the law of God. And he knew that he could call on his conscience to respond and his conscience would tell him, I'm telling you the truth. I have nothing in me that tells me I'm doing something wrong here. And the other point was the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's the third witness. The Holy Spirit lives where? In him. The Holy Spirit knows his thoughts, knows his heart, knows his motives. And so he calls on Christ, he calls on conscience, he calls on the Holy Spirit to confirm the fact that what he's about to say is absolutely true. All of that to get to the next point, which is the compassion of Paul for the tragedy facing the Jews. Look at verse 2. This is what he's going to say. This is part, part one of a two-part statement that he's going to make that he's calling true. 
He says he has great sorrow and continual grief in his heart. That's the first thing he says. I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. The word great, megale, we get the word mega, massive, large. The word sorrow in the first part of verse 2 is the word lupe. It just simply means pain of body or mind or grief and can be translated as it is sorrow. It could be understood as distress or vexation or the heaviness of sorrow that comes with that. But that's not all that he has in mind here. He's not saying that I have just great sorrow. He adds another word to it. He says, I have continual grief in my heart. The word grief here is the translation of the word odune. And the word odune refers to severe, listen to this, severe emotional anxiety and distress, great distress, intense anxiety. One lexicon said it refers to intense emotional pain, And he goes on and says, it is a consuming grief, which is emotionally lethal if experienced apart from God's grace and God's comforts. That's pretty powerful grief. This is the kind of grief that paralyzes you. The kind of grief that overruns you, that consumes you. One other lexicon referred to it as being tormented. The verb form means to cause intense intense pain. So this is the kind of, he has sorrow, but then he says, I have continual grief. Or or you could even read it this way, I am continually tormented with this distress and intense anxiety and pain that comes, this emotional pain that I experience. He says it's continual. You know what he means by that? It keeps going. Oh, it's all the time. It doesn't end. In fact, he uses that same verb only one other time, and it's in 2 Timothy 1, 3, when Paul says, I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing, there's the word, I remember you in my prayers night and day. So he prays night and day. He does it continually. So just as much as he prays continually for these, he also has continual torment and grief and lethal emotional anxiety over the fact that his people Israel are lost. Now, folks, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I could ever say that I've had that kind of pain. Can you? Can you say that you grieve all the time for your lost neighbor or your friends or your loved ones? Are you consumed with it, that it just overruns you and and takes control? Jeremiah, the prophets, often express their sorrow over the condition of Israel. In Jeremiah 9, 1, he says this, Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night and for the slain of the daughter of my people. In Jeremiah 13, 17, he says, But if you will not hear, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. Lamentations, my eyes overflow with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eyes flow and do not cease without interruption till the Lord from heaven looks down and sees. My eyes bring suffering to my soul because all of the daughters of my city. Jesus had the same thing, same kind of sorrow. Luke chapter 19, verse 41 says, and now as he drew near, He saw the city, that is Jerusalem, and it says he wept over it. He wept over it. He said this, if you had known, even you, especially in your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you, to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation why is he weeping he's not weeping because jerusalem the actual structure is going to be destroyed or even the temple is going to be leveled he's weeping because of the lost blind condition of israel they rejected their messiah completely what would cause such intense pain and Paul's heart, Paul refers to it in Romans 9. He says it a couple of ways. 
In Romans 9, 31, he says, I'm grieving is the assumption. I'm grieving because they have not attained to the law of righteousness. Romans 9, 31. Also in Romans 9, 32, he says there that they have stumbled at the stumbling stone. In chapter 10, verse 1, he says, I, he says, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that Israel might be saved. He says, but they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They're ignorant of God's righteousness, and they haven't submitted to the righteousness of God. In Romans eleven seven, 7, it says that um, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. But here's the words that bring his grief. The rest were blinded. They were blinded. Romans eleven eight says, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. What was producing this intense grief and sorrow in Paul's heart was the fact that his people were blind to the glorious gospel. They had rejected the very claims of Christ. And what was facing them was enormous, eternal tragedy in hell forever. And he knew it. And that takes us to the last point. We saw the com commitment of Paul to the truth, the compassion of Paul for the tragedy, and then third, the confession of Paul for the trade. And that's going to sound a little weird, but you'll understand what I mean in a moment. Look at verse 3. Verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. You know who he's talking about. He's talking about his brothers. He's talking about his nation. He's talking about his people. He's talking about the Jews. This is one of the most profound and amazing statements in all of Scripture. The love that Paul has for the lost is astounding. It explains why so often he was so willing to lay down his physical life for people, even Gentiles and Jews alike. And there's no doubt that Paul had a passion for the lost to see that they are saved and forgiven of their sin. And he would rejoice whenever he saw that happen. He would be filled with joy whenever people came to Christ, both Jew and Gentile. And here we have even examples in the past in the history of the church where some have had that kind of passion, like Paul had, like John Knox. When he reflected upon God's love for lost people, John Knox said, give me Scotland or I die. Henry Martin said on one occasion, oh, that I were a flame of fire in the hand of God. And even David Brainerd, who prayed that he might be burned out for God, and he did. He died before he was 30. There have been examples in the history of the church that have shown people who had a passion like Paul, but... Very few come close to Paul. The only other one I could think of that had any passion that would be as much as or beyond Paul was Christ. Paul's passion was such that he would give his life physically, but yes, the point of this passage is not that. The point of this passage, he would be willing, if it could happen, to give his eternal soul for them. This is where it goes beyond us, folks. We have a hard time with that. The love that Paul had with, for the, his, his lost brothers and sisters in Christ was absolutely enormous. Look at it again. We'll just work our way through it quickly here. We're about out of time. But verse 3 says, for I could wish. And the reason why it's worded like that is because it's not possible. It's just not possible. He, he could wish that it would be like this. But what you remember in verse 1, he says, I tell you the truth. And the point is, what he's wishing is true. What he desires that could happen, although it won't happen, is true. If it could happen that he could be separated from Christ so that his people Israel could be saved, he would do it. But he knows that it can't happen. That's why he says, I could wish that it were possible. He knows it can't happen because if you remember, he, he wrote the verses right before this text, right? He's the one who told us that we were secure in the love of Christ and that we would never be separated from him. He said in Romans 8, 38, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principles, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. 
He also was the very one who wrote the verses prior to that that tell us that if God is for us, who can be against us in verse 31? That the very one that we may think could judge us is the very one who died for us. And he's also making intercession for us. So in verse 35, he would say, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He was the one also that wrote the previous verse. In verse 30, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And who he called, these he also justified. And the one that he justified, these he also glorified. There's no way out of this. No way. Not that you ever would really want out, but Paul said, if I could get out to save my brothers, I would get out. Even Jesus made it clear that it's not possible. In John 10, 28, he says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Period. John 6, 37, you remember what Jesus said? All that the Father gives me will come to me. And listen to this. Here's the other verse, part of it. And the one who comes, I will by no means cast out. No way out, Paul. No way out. But he knows that. He says, if I could, the word that is translated here, wish, is the word ukomai. It's actually a word that has been translated to wish or could be understood as to pray for. It's not the strongest word for prayer. The word that is often used for prayer is the word prosukomai, which is stronger in the sense of petitioning God. But this is more of a wish, a desire. If it were possible, what does he say? What does he want? Look at verse 3. He says, if I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ. He uses the word ego, and he intensifies it with the word myself, makes it emphatic, making it clear that he's talking just about himself. I'm not expecting anybody else to do this, but me, if I could do it, I would. If I myself could be, look at the word, accursed from Christ. That's the word anathema. It's not a pretty word. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew equivalent of that word could go both ways. It could mean something that is devoted to honor and position for the service of God, or it could mean something that is devoted and committed to destruction. And when you get to the New Testament and Paul uses this word, just follow how he uses it, you'll know what he means. Like, for instance, whenever he uses the word anathema, he says it this way in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. That's anathema. Galatians 1, 8 and 9. But even if we, an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. As we have said before, I say to you again, anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be anathema. So what is Paul talking about? He's not talking about flowers and lovely days. He's talking about being separated from God for all eternity, cursed of God, punished forever in hell. That's what he's talking about. In fact, he even t he, you could say he intensifies it. Commentators go different ways on this, saying that the uh, word in verse 3, uh, where it says, uh, I myself were accursed from Christ. Some make it two events to make it strong, like he desires to be anathema, uh, cursed by God, and then the second one, from Christ, separated from Christ, apo to Christu, separated from Christ. And any time, if you, look, if you're separated from Christ, you're in trouble. Separation from Christ means you're lost and you're going to be in hell if you're separated from Christ. Some believe it goes together with anathema. Some believe Paul's talking about two things, which makes it even that much stronger. Listen. Frankly, folks, hell is hell. If you're anathema and you're separated from Christ, you're in a very, very dark place for all eternity. This is an amazing thing. For Paul is not talking about, Lord, I just pray and I wish I could have a very bad day so that my people Israel could come to Christ. Or maybe, Lord, I could lose my job and sacrifice all that I have and lose my house and everything I have monetarily wise so that people could come to Christ. No, he's not talking about anything physical. He's not talking about his physical life. He's not talking about his comfort level. 
He's saying, I'm willing to give up my eternal soul and place it in hell forever if my people Israel could be saved. One commentator said, a spark from the fire of Christ's substitutionary love is pointed out here. Martin Luther said this, he says, it seems incredible that a man would desire to be damned in order that the damned might be saved. So who's he talking about? Well, it may seem pretty simple on the surface, but maybe there's more to it than we know. Is he talking about the lost in general? Well, not really, because we know the context is talking about Israel, right? He's talking specifically about that. We're not saying that he doesn't have a passion for the lost, and we're not saying that he doesn't desire that all the Gentiles come to Christ, but this is the only place in the New Testament that Paul gives this kind of commitment, where he's willing to go an extra step. He's willing to say, I'll put my eternal soul in hell if my people Israel can be saved. So the next question is, if it's not the lost in general or even the Gentiles he has in mind, is it all of Israel or some of Israel? Well, if you look at the text in verse 3, he says, my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, you are Israelites. He gives a broad, general reflection of the Israelites, the Jewish people. And I'm going to step out on a limb here because I have yet to find a commentator that's addressed this, and I've got 50, but none of them will even talk about this or go there, but I'm going to go there. And what I believe is this, is that Paul has a specific group in mind among Israel. Let me show you what I mean. Because if you look at the text in verse 1, or excuse me, verse 3, he says this, that he would wish that himself were accursed from Christ, and the next word is the what, what word? For. You see that word for? That's the same word, huper, that is used for substitutionary atonement for Christ. In other words, Jesus died for us. You, we went through that, right? Jesus dies for us, meaning he dies in our place and on our behalf, right? That's huper, that's substitutionary atonement. I'm not saying that Paul even had the thought that he could die a substitutionary atonement. I know he knows that's not possible. But what he is asking for here, Lord, you take me for them. In other words, send me to hell for them to go to heaven. I want to trade. I want to go there for them. I want to go to hell for them so that they can go to heaven. Would you do that? He knows theologically it's not. As one commentator said rightly, this is more emotionally driven than theologically driven. But it is clearly Something that Paul has in his mind, thinking, Lord, I love them so much. I desire that they come to Christ so much. Would you be willing to trade? Would you take me to hell for them? That's the idea behind the word for. For my brethren. For those who are Israelites. On behalf of them, I would take their place. Another thought I have in mind about this is this. His passion that he has, this kind of passion to be a substitute, if you will, to go to hell for them in their place, to give trade, if you will, would not be for the elect that he's going to talk about later. Because he already knows they're going to get saved. In fact, in Romans 9, 6, just two verses later, he says, but not, not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they, are all, for they are not all Israel who are Israel and what he means by that is, look, just because you claim to be an Israelite externally doesn't mean you're an Israelite in internally. You're not a true Jew in the sense of a Messianic Jew who believes in Christ as Messiah and Savior. Just because you're part of Israel doesn't automatically guarantee that you're saved. His point is, is that there is a remnant that is saved. He knows that. He says it later in chapter 9, verse 27. He says, Isaiah also cried out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. Perhaps since Paul is so keenly aware of the fact that God will save some of the Jews, maybe his continual sorrow and grief is for the ones that he's not going to save. That's what Romans 9, 10, and 11 is about. How God saves the, the elect of Israel. And what gives so many trouble is the fact that he doesn't save all of Israel. That's what's troubling. You know, this is something similar to what Moses prayed, in fact. If you remember in Exodus 32, you don't have to turn to it, but listen to this. You're familiar with this. This is at the event of the golden calf, all right? Major, major sin, major problem, right? Right at the very foot of the mountain, 
They erect a golden calf and worship it to create an image of the true God. That's what they were doing. So there's great sin in the camp. And it says in chapter 32, verse 30 of Exodus, Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Then he says this, Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Moses, what? You're going to make atonement for our sin? Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive them their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book that you have written. That's basically the same idea that Paul has in mind. And so what Moses is saying, take me. Take me. Paul is saying, take me. That these people can be forgiven. That these people can be saved. That they can be redeemed and brought into salvation. There's something to be said about Paul's compassion, isn't there? I mean, think about this. I mean, uh, how often do you grieve? How often do we grieve at all for the other, the other part of the plan of God that Romans is going to talk about? Romans 9 is going to talk about it. The vessels of wrath prepared beforehand for destruction. How often do we shed a tear for any of that? I believe that's what Paul's talking about here. He knows that God's got a remnant of Israel. He's going to teach the entire thing. But what about the millions who never are saved? Does it bother us at all? Do we weep at all for them? Something's to be said for the compassion that Paul has for the eternally damned. And there's no greater burden, I don't believe there is, there's no greater burden that anyone can carry than the weight of a soul. You have a loved one that's lost, it's a heavy burden to carry. Someone that's a friend of yours or a spouse of yours or a child of yours that's lost, it's a weight that is heavy to carry. The burden is enormous. But I would pray that God would use what we have in the Apostle Paul's example To strengthen our own burden for the lost. It moved him. It made him do what he did. It gave him courage and strength and boldness. And the willingness to stand for the truth and to confront error. And to be willing to speak the gospel in a community that hated it. Probably one of the ones that we often go to when we think about a soul winner or one who had a compassion for the souls of men would be Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He preached a sermon in February 4th, 1871 entitled Compassion for Souls. I'll give you just a quick quote from that sermon that he preached. He said this, the reasons why we should tenderly have compassion toward the perishing sons of men are these. First, Observe the dreadful nature of the calamity which will overwhelm them. Calamities occurring to our fellow men naturally awaken us to a feeling of commiseration. But what calamity under heaven can equal the ruin of a soul? What misery can be equal to that of a man being cast away from God and subject to his wrath without end? Today... Your hearts are moved as you hear of the harrowing details of war. They have been dreadful indeed. Houses burnt, happy families driven out as vagabonds upon the face of the earth, domestic circles and quiet households broken up. Men are wounded, mangled, and massacred by the thousands and starved. But the miseries of war, if they were confined to this world alone, were nothing compared with the enormous catastrophe of tens of thousands of spirits accursed by sin and driven by the justice of God into a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The edge of the sword grows blunt at last. The flame of war dies out for lack of fuel. But lo, I see before me a sword which will never be quiet, a fire that is unquenchable. Alas, That the souls of men should fall beneath the infinite ire of justice. To be without bread for body is terrible. 
but to be without the bread of life eternal, none of us can tell the weight of horror which lies there. He went on to say in that same sermon regarding a funeral for a lost soul, a fellow preacher of his was preaching that sermon, and he had these words to say about that situation of the lost soul. He said, the sun has veiled its light. The moon has veiled her brightness. The ocean is covered with mourning and the heavens with sackcloth. And if the whole fabric of nature could become animated and vocal, it would not be possible for her to utter a groan too deep or a cry too piercing to express the magnitude and the extent of the catastrophe of a lost soul. And he's right. That's just the beginning of Romans 9. Let's pray together.